131st session of the weekly huddle. I'm your host Anup and joining me today is my friend and co-host Praneet. We both are cardiologists working at Kim's Hospital. Most of you are quite familiar with the huddle format, which is an unscripted audience level interaction where we address common clinical scenarios that we encounter in our daily clinical practice. We typically pick up a clinical case and uh, restrict our discussion around that uh, so that uh, uh, we kind of engage in a very casual discussion. The very premise of the huddle is to bring such casual discussions uh, into a little bit more organized platform like this one so that we can share our ideas. While we do want to talk about uh, uh, science and guidelines, but with the huddle, we tend to help a physician translate established knowledge to uh, clinical practice, taking some of the local factors into account. And truly speaking, in today's discussion, some of these local factors is what we are going to be uh, talking about, things which are not necessarily answered by science, but at the same time, we do have to keep uh, in mind. Uh, please uh, uh, note that this is not a speaker and audience model, rather a casual interaction, which means uh, any of the attendees uh, is welcome to uh, share his or her thought. All you need to do is raise your hand and I will give you a chance to speak or put your questions on the chat box, or you can unmute yourself whenever there is a downtime and you can share your uh, thoughts. So with that, I will start uh, today's clinical case. And just to give you a background, so this case, actually we discussed about uh, aortic stenosis and how to select patients a few weeks back on the huddle platform. But this particular case was discussed in uh, one of the WhatsApp groups recently. And while the decision making was not that difficult, there were few thoughts which actually were brought up uh, during the discussion uh, in, the, in that WhatsApp uh, group, uh, which consisted of all cardiologists. So I thought because there was some discussion around uh, these clinical cases, I thought it was worth uh, at least uh, uh, putting this uh, clinical question up one more time so that uh, we have uh, a little bit of clarity in what we are doing and more so also to revisit some of the discussions that we had earlier. I don't know much detail about uh, the clinical history of this patient because, uh, as I said, I did not particularly see this patient. This was a clinical case which was uh, briefly discussed on the WhatsApp group. So, uh, the case pertaining to today's discussion is a 45-year-old female. She, at least to my knowledge, does not have any major comorbidities. She was recently diagnosed with severe aortic stenosis when she was evaluated for uh, new onset dyspnea at the time. Uh, I don't have any other clinical details available. The story that follows is this patient uh, was advised to undergo transcatheter aortic valve replacement. And uh, this patient went to another cardiologist for a second opinion. And this is the second cardiologist or the second opinion cardiologist who put in this query on the WhatsApp group about what should be the best course of action for this particular patient, just trying to understand how uh, we should be engaging in decision making for such cases. So the discussion point that I have put in here, and because I don't have any discrete clinical information about this patient, Today's discussion can be a little bit more generic, and uh, I believe that that should be all right. So the discussion points for lifetime management of severe aortic stenosis, as in this particular case, uh, is number one, should this patient undergo aortic valve re replacement? Number two, uh, should this patient uh, get preoperative coronary angiogram? Or which all patients should get preoperative coronary angiogram? If you decide that AVR is indicated, should you choose surgical AVR or should you choose a transcatheter AVR as in TAVI? If you decide to choose surgery, would you go for a metallic valve? Would you go for a bioprosthetic valve? And in the bioprosthetic, we have a lot of options, stented bioprosthesis, stentless bioprosthesis, and then homographs. If you choose to do TAVI, then uh, would you choose a balloon expandable or a self-expandable valve? And also there will be a discussion about future considerations. She's a 45-year-old female. Uh, you can certainly expect her to live a uh, relatively longer healthy life. So uh, definitely future considerations also have to be taken into account. Now, in today's attendees, I do see a few cardiologists who have joined us. So once, uh, Praneet, you give your opinion about this particular case, 
I will be requesting uh, each one of you uh, to share your thoughts about uh, uh, the discussion point that we have brought up. Uh, I will I will pick up each one of you in terms of uh, uh, trying to get your thought process. So, uh, Praneet, this case comes to you, 45 female, uh, severe aortic stenosis. Uh, I'm assuming no other major comorbidities. Uh, please walk us through what will be your thought, thought process. Yeah, so uh, symptomatic um, severe aortic stenosis. Patient needs um, aortic valve replacement. So the the pertinent uh, questions are very much relevant. So uh, we need to look at um, the so-called lifetime management. Uh, the the term that we are using you know, today is that um, when whatever decision that we take today, it should not it should be equally taken into consideration for the entire lifetime of this patient. As you said, uh, she is having at least 20, 30 years of uh, life expectancy. So any therapy that has to be done should uh, equally be beneficial for the next 20, 30 years. When we talk about longevity of the valve, uh, all the bioprosthetic valves have uh, close to 8 to 10 years and of um, uh, durability. And uh, the the older the patient is, the more is the longevity and younger the patient is, less is the longevity. So she is 45 for her. If we put a bioprosthetic valve, I expect the valve to degenerate much faster. Even if we take 10 years um, at 55 years of age, she will require a repeat uh, valve replacement. And uh, maybe in another 10 years, another valve replacement. So all throughout her lifetime, I am expecting uh, three procedures for her. In that regard, um, uh, therapy which can give her uh, long-term uh, free uh, freedom from hospitalization or freedom from uh, repeat interventions. That will be a metallic valve. So this patient, I would uh, recommend a surgical uh, valve replacement with a metallic valve considering her age and her life expectancy. The question about preoperative workup, any patient, uh, any male more than 40 years uh, should ideally require an angiogram to evaluate coronary artery disease. Women, the threshold is 50 years. She is 45 years of age. No risk factors, but I still give a benefit of doubt to her. And I would be uh, recommending a diagnostic coronary angiogram for evaluating coronary artery disease. In, in case if it has, then uh, we can address the same thing. And uh, I would try to look into whether there are any contraindications to anticoagulation uh, because the history uh, is uh, incomplete. I presume that she does not have any um, contraindications to anticoagulation. Hence, the decision will be to go for a surgical aortic valve replacement with a metallic valve. That would be the recommendation that I would give to this patient. Oh, tune up. So, uh, Praneet, I'll play devil's advocate here. I will, yes. uh, uh, I will uh, give you the scenarios where the decision making that you are proposing, which sounds very straightforward and very reasonable, but uh, I will give you the scenarios where the decision making may not be quite obvious. And this particular patient that I'm talking about. But before I do so, I do want to share one more clinical case which came to us. Uh, that patient actually came to us in person uh, last week. So I'm just trying to add this clinical case just so that we have a we have a little bit of discussion around. So this patient number two that I, that that I had, uh, this patient is a 46 year old guy, and he had diagnosed severe aortic stenosis, uh, severe mitral stenosis. Excuse me. He had severe mitral stenosis with moderate mitral regurgitation as a rheumatic heart disease uh, that was diagnosed last year when he was having heart failure and whatnot. And at that time, when he was of age 45, so of the same age as this case that we're talking about, he was advised and he did undergo metallic mitral valve replacement using a St. Jude bileaflet metallic valve. I'm using the name because that is pretty much the standard of care for uh, the metallic valve these days. So he got that valve done last year uh, to be exactly precise about 15 months back. He had been doing absolutely fine. 
He is on anticoagulation, uh, anticoagulation with acinocumarol. And uh, in his words, he says his compliance rate with the drug is 100%. His uh, monthly INR check is uh, more than 95%. And in more than 90% of the time, his INR has been more than two. That is, that is as per his uh, wordings and uh, uh, the way he's sounding, I have no reason not to believe, believe him. So this guy started having some dyspnea, which is non-specific, but is definitely there with exertion, not a frank heart failure. It's a insidious onset uh, symptom, which has been going on for about two, three months or so. So he came to me uh, for an opinion on that. Uh, he didn't have any physical exam findings of heart failure whatsoever. Uh, he actually was uh, feeling fine. He was able to walk. He was able to climb a floor of stairs. Uh, metallic sound was a little muffled, but still I could hear it. So this patient, when we did evaluation, we found that on fluoroscopy, one of the leaflet was completely stuck. The other leaflet was not stuck, but it was not freely mobile in my opinion. But TEE at that time clearly showed that one of the leaflet was stuck in the closed position. The other leaflet was moving with a mean gradient of approximately touching 18 to 20 millimeters uh, without any other pathology. So this is clearly a stuck valve which happened about 15 months later in a patient who categorically mentions that he had been very, very compliant with his INR. And the most recent INR that was checked was 4.3 indeed. In the TE, you could see some soft tissue shadow surrounding the valve. It was very difficult to ascertain whether that soft tissue shadow was uh, or organized thrombus versus it was a panis formation. A uh, little bit of discussion that happened that in 15 months for a 29 millimeters endured by leaflet valve, can a panis form that, that fast uh, or can this patient have a subclinical thrombosis or a chronic thrombosis even in the setting of therapeutic INR? Now, this patient is unfortunate because now he, he will have to undergo a second valve surgery within 15 months uh, of the first one. So there was a lot of discussion that was going on for this particular case to the surgeon and to the cardiologist as a general uh, that A, first of all, can we differentiate whether this is thrombus or whether this is panis? Second, why so early? Why so aggressive? Uh, if we do a redo surgery, what will happen? Can we prevent this complication for the second valve also? Should he get a second valve as a bioprosthetic valve or should he get a, another brand of a metallic valve? Is he developing allergy to any of the components? A lot of those discussions that went through. I saw this patient last week only. I don't have the clinical outcome uh, to discuss yet. The reason why I brought up this case is because whenever we are talking about metallic valve or whenever we are talking about surgery, we are all fearful that a second surgery should not happen. Uh, there should not be a need for a second surgery. At least we try to avoid as much as possible. Uh, and of course, whenever you get these kind of cases, then the decision making in your next case, which is similar to this, now you start doubting whether you should put metal valve in this. What, what if panas formation happens again? Would you subject this patient for redo surgery again? And all those things. So I will discuss some of the entities which had been, uh, which were discussed earlier in relation to this patient. So number one, at age 45 uh, and being a female, there is a good chance this patient will have a small annulus. And as we all know that when these patients with small annulus, they go for surgery versus TAVI, then as a general, TAVI, particularly with a self-expandable supraannular valve, leads to a better hemodynamic gradient as compared to surgical valve. So in a patient who has got a small annulus, uh, you may have a very high incidence of patient prosthesis mismatch, whether it's a metallic valve, whether it's a bioprosthetic valve, uh, maybe a little bit lesser with metallic valve, but you can still have it. Uh, if you do have patient prosthesis mismatch, again, we don't have a very good answer to that. We are kind of uh, stuck in that regard. Uh, similarly, this patient at age 45, if she has severe aortic stenosis without rheumatic heart disease, there is a very good chance that valve is a bicuspid aortic valve, which means there may be concurrent aortopathy, may not be to the degree where you would require an ascending aorta repair at this point of time. But if you go for a metallic valve surgery, it is possible that after five years or 10 years, now you have to do a redo surgery for the ascending aorta not for the valve per se, that of course is going to complicate things. Uh, 
the third thing which was discussed was that if you put a metallic valve now, because she has approximately 20, 30 years of life expectancy, may not in the next 15 months, but it is possible after eight years, 10 years, she may develop panus formation. And now she will be requiring a second surgery at the age of 60, 65, where the metallic valve will be explanted and a new valve will be placed. That surgery will have a higher risk. Then number four, if you do want to send her for surgery, if you put a surgical aortic valve, she can get a tower in surgical valve after 10 years, which will give her a good 20, 25 years of life. So might will use a bioprosthetic valve as compared to metallic valve. Also knowing the fact that if you give metallic valve now, she's 45 at this point of time, but after five, seven years, her bleeding risk is going to go up uh, and she's going to continue requiring uh, anticoagulation. So how does all of that play around? Now, whatever I said, all of these parameters may not hold a scientific ground. I agree with that. But the reason why I'm bringing all this up is because all of these become a discussion point whenever we are trying to address in that particular patient, whether that patient should go for surgery, should go for TAVI, should go for a metallic valve, bioprosthetic valve, or something else for that matter. So I will pause here and uh, I will ask uh, opinion. I'll take opinion from uh, my colleagues here. And please excuse me, I don't recognize all of you, but I'm going to uh, ask questions from each one of you and get your opinion. So uh, Dr. Ali, if you can hear me, can you please unmute yourself and share your thoughts about this particular case? Surgery, TAVI, which surgery, which valve, and overall thought process? Dr. Ali. Yeah, uh, hello? Yeah, hi, Dr. Ravi, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, uh, so very nice insights, Dr. Anu. Uh, uh, I agree, actually, uh, being considering the age of the patient, uh, uh, 40 years approximately, and she has a long lifespan. So she would uh, do actually well with the surgical IIT wall replacement. And considering and keeping in mind that in future, uh, this valve, uh, will again uh, lead to, I mean, uh, will require replacement certain uh, stage of time. So at that stage, uh, redo surgery or or uh, according to that that prevailing situation at that time. So I fully agree. And I think uh, Saver uh, is the first choice for this patient. And uh, uh, and uh, coming to uh, Tower, well, we can consider the Tower also, but I don't think it's an ideal first choice. Why? Because of the degeneration of the tissue and in due course of time, uh, maybe 10 years, 10 years max, you can say, she would be again uh, coming back to you with problems and you would uh, require to uh, recommend her again. So at that point of time, again, uh, it would be complicated. So and further the guidelines also say that, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, not exactly guidelines, but the recommendations say that the younger age, we, we advise uh, surgical IIT wall replacement. And maybe later on, uh, once they're 60, 65 years of age, and uh, then Tower plays a very good role. That also, after rolling out uh, Saber. Yes, Dr. Anup. Thank you. Dr. Ravi, before uh, huh? you mute yourself back again, question. So if you send this patient for surgery, would you advise for a metallic valve or a bioprosthetic valve? Well, considering the age, a metallic uh, prosthetic valve would do good for this patient. What is your thought about concerns for panis formation in these patients? Do you think that's a valid concern which should preclude us from not putting metallic valves? No, I don't think uh, the fear of panis should uh, stop you for advising uh, a metallic prosthetic valve in this patient uh, because metallic prosthetic valves have a longer life. We all know and considering only 40 years of the patient she has that entire life before her. So uh, and, uh, a metallic prosthetic valve would do well. And panis, you, uh, yes, there is concern for panis, but we never know that. We cannot say that in 100% of patients, everyone will develop panis. Yes, the, there is a chance that they will develop, but uh, at least uh, it will take a longer time. And even if you put a, a bioprosthetic valve, uh, it will degenerate some max 10 years. So you need to reconsider again at the age of 50, 55 years for this patient. That would be uh, relatively young and a redo surgery would 
also be i mean surgeons will also be apprehensive so my thought process is give her a, a time of at least 20 25 years if there is no panic or so they should pull her until 60 65 years and uh, then uh, think about it later on at that point of time perfect thank you so much uh, dr ravi i'll move on uh, yeah thank you dr ali if you can hear me uh, please feel free to unmute yourself and share your thoughts about today's discussion and i will move on through the list uh, dr sandeep if you can hear me can you please uh, unmute yourself and share your thoughts yeah uh, hi dr anup uh, hi everyone uh, uh, good evening so considering this case uh, scenario i would uh, straight away uh, without any other this thing uh, any thoughts in mind i would recommend a surgical aortic valve replacement in this case yes i might be thinking of tavi only in case where a surgery cannot be performed in view of any chest wall deformities or any abnormality or any uh, something like patient cannot be uh, put on anti coagulation uh, so other than these couple of these things which are not uh, which are very unusual i wouldn't think of tavin this case i wouldn't be even keeping it as a choice i would straight away go with a surgical aortic valve replacement with a metallic valve and uh, yes uh, the some unfortunate incidents do happen in our clinical practice as you have notice it an mbr failing in just 15 months of age uh, with 15 months yes but 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 as we know when we go through the guidelines or the rct trials and whatever uh, we usually see unfortunate cases of failure being happened but yes it's tough to answer uh, here uh, by uh, all uh, about the redo surgeries and everything but that shouldn't deter us from the guidelines practicing guidelines so i would uh, just recommend straight away for a surgical aortic valve replacement with a uh, metallic valve and yes it's a gray zone regarding an angiogram but again yes if you are going for a surgical valve replacement why not a, a diagnostic angiography it will only help us in uh, helping the patient that's it. Uh, th- those are my views dr anu sandeep same question to you also metallic valve versus bioprosthetic valve metallic metallic valve what is your age cut off for bioprosthetic valve in a otherwise uh, healthy individual no uh, yeah i would consider for metallic for at least 60 years of age as per the guidelines 60 to 65 and after that yes bioprosthetic in the advent of this tabby business where now a failed bioprosthetic can very easily be fixed with uh, a tabby inside uh, shouldn't that drop the age from 60 65 to a little lesser in terms of bioprosthetic uh <laughs> yeah that's a difficult question to answer but considering the life expectancy in india around 60 60 between 65 to 68 uh, something like that so yes uh, metallic definitely helps us in uh, uh, for further more uh, longevity compared to the uh, bioprosthetic in my view so i would uh, yeah it's a, it's again a gray zone if the age is between 55 to 60 but still if the patient is fit enough and the fragility score isn't much then then uh, i would like to go for a uh, recommend for, uh, for a metallic valve it's Thank you, Sandeep. Uh, if you have any further questions or comments, please feel free to unmute at at any given time. Uh, if anybody has got any thoughts, uh, please uh, raise your hand or put the question in chat box, or you can unmute. And while you do so, I'll continue my discussion with uh, Pranith because uh, uh, I'm not able to pick anybody else up in the audience today. So, Pranith, uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions, and if you could just share your thoughts about this. So now I'm going to speculate from here on because I don't have the exact uh, anatomical or clinical information. So if this patient, which at an Indian lady, 45, uh, quite expected, uh, if this patient has an annulus of 19 millimeters uh, on CT or on echo, would you still recommend uh, surgery for this patient? Yes, I look. 
still i would um, recommend uh, this uh, patient because again the uh, trade off of um, having a residual gradient be because of shorter annulus versus the need for repeat intervention so these are the two things that i would uh, have to balance it out so a uh, need for repeat intervention is also there with the residual gradients and the need for um, uh, repeat uh, valve replacement if i put a tiver how do i choose probably i would still give the benefit of doubt for replacing uh, uh, replacing the valve with a metallic valve and i would request the surgeon to try doing a root dilatation if possible so that we can have a better annulus and place a larger valve uh, but ideally still i would uh, prefer uh, surgical valve replacement with metallic valve so the root enlargement business while it is it is it is like a dream come true i i i really challenge every cardiologist who is listening to this and in their clinical practice uh, whenever you are following up your patients who underwent aortic valve replacement please look at how many of those patients actually get root uh, enlargement when we discuss this in the surgical meet or when we discuss this in the data set but there are a lot of patients who qualify for root enlargement but if you look at a systematic study in whichever registry analysis in whichever hospitals the incidence of root enlargements are in single digit and that too hardly 2% or so so for some reason surgeons don't like to do root enlargement either because it increases surgical morbidity it increases surgical mortality uh, it adds more complexity to the procedure uh, regardless of whatever it is, you tell your surgeon that, hey, this is a 19 millimeter, 18 millimeter annulus, please do a root enlargement, put at least a 21 millimeter valve. Uh, I can assure you uh, that patient, when you go and visit post-operative day one, there is a good chance that patient would have got an 18 or 19 millimeter valve. Uh, Praneet, do you have a trick that you can discuss with your surgeons so that you can convince the surgeon to do uh, root enlargement? No, no, I don't have any trick. It's just a, a request. That is that is where I I would probably want to hear uh, from a surgeon uh, if it was available. Uh, like, what is it that um, kind of stops or prevents a surgeon from considering a root enlargement? I can understand that it adds to the procedural time and its uh, subsequent um, complications. But uh, as per the logic, this seems to be the right thing to do. But I think the overall outcome is something that we need to pay attention to. And probably that is where surgeons um, consciously prefer not to do this. Uh, so there is no special tricks there. You just discuss and request the surgeon. Uh, and as you rightly said, um, even I haven't found uh, uh, many patients getting a root enlargement unless there is any associated iotopathy. If they have an isolated valvular issues, they do end up getting a smaller a smaller valves and there is no added uh, root uh, intervention uh, to to accommodate a larger valve the second question praneet and and what you rightly said is if we had a surgeon in the meeting we would have addressed this question to them those were my two guests for today but looks like they both got occupied somewhere so unfortunately i don't have any surgeons representation here the the next question which i will have it for you is uh, Ross procedure. Now, last, I believe a couple of years back, there was this, this good data that came out which said that Ross procedure in adults where you can put a pulmonic autograft at the aortic position and then you put a bioprosthetic uh, valve uh, at the pulmonic position uh, that actually uh, will give a much longer longevity at the, uh, at the aortic site. Uh, any, any thoughts about doing Ross procedure in these kind of patients where you will get a very good gradient and you will get because it's a homograft or it's an autograft. You will get a very good longevity. And what is your what is your thought process on ROS procedure? My experience is limited with ROS procedure, but with the knowledge that I have, I believe with by doing a ROS procedure, we are trying to uh, remove one problem and giving a new problem. So we are removing the pulmonary valve or the valve at the pulmonic position and keeping it in aortic position. But what about the pulmonic valve? So that it, it also needs 
its own valve patient will have a free pulmonary regurgitation which sometimes is definitely accommodated but um, again in the younger patients they do end up uh, developing um, free pulmonary uh, regurgitation with associated right ventricular dilatation and dysfunction so he will again require a repeat uh, a pulmonary valve intervention so the the question is now which valve will you place at which setting so if we are putting a native valve from the pulmonary position and putting it in an aortic position and you want to place a bioprosthetic valve at a pulmonary position uh, how can can this work out uh, probably yes but if we understand that pulmonary circulation is a low pressure circulation in comparison to aortic position so the rates of degeneration or the rates of valve thrombosis are uh, slightly higher in the pulmonary position in comparison to aortic position if we try and look at the data of uh, mitral versus aortic valve again the rates of strength thrombosis or sorry valve thrombosis are higher at mitral position so maybe i would think that um, putting metallic valve at pulmonary position is not feasible bioprosthetic valve probably can be kept but again it will degenerate we may do a repeat intervention but equally the risk of valve thrombosis and probably the need for anticoagulation will come up which defeats the whole purpose of putting a bioprosthetic valve in the first place so uh, i i think it's a tricky situation here uh, currently because the uh, available options are more or equally the understanding or the experience of the surgeons is uh, bigger uh, e bras procedure for in today's practice probably uh, is not uh, appropriate in my opinion and i think we should stick to the uh, age old um, valve replacements with um, bioprosthetic or metallic valve depending on the age of the patient or if the patient needs uh, anticoagulation due to any other association like these patients may have uh if they are, it is because of a rheumatic heart disease they have an associated atrial fibrillation where they are receiving already anticoagulation then the decision making is quite simple you uh, give them metallic valve versus any other contraindications uh, relative or absolute for giving anticoagulations so in my opinion i think ross procedure uh, should not be done unless there is any other option left then the follow up question uh, yeah the follow up question that would come is uh, how about doing a surgery and then putting a stentless valve something like uh, uh, or sutureless valve sorry not a stentless valve but a sutureless valve like your percival and all these that that we get which are which are like a pseudo uh, which are which look like tabby valve but it's actually implanted surgically i'm sure pranit you have seen percival in your clinical experience so patients who have got smaller annulus if they get a sutureless valve they definitely will give a better gradient of obviously it will be a bioprosthetic valve do you think that is something which can be justified in patients at her age of 45 if i if i remember currently the current data with the percival the outcomes are probably not that um, not that great in comparison to a regular uh, uh, surgical valve replacement with a bioprosthetic valve uh, the, the whole um, uh, chase of long term uh, outcomes uh, uh, in and uh, defeating the purpose of uh, short term outcomes like you want the procedure to be uneventful you want the post operative period to be uneventful and patient should have a good short term and then we are talking about all these uh, discussion is on uh, long term management as well if my understanding or my knowledge is correct uh, percival valves had its own um, challenges where the short term outcomes itself were a problem and i believe uh, percival valves currently are not um, uh, popular anymore but if we can have uh, something like a percival valve which is uh equally offering good short term outcomes then probably it is definitely worth considering um, doing a, a stentless uh, surgical valve replacement uh, uh with a this stentless valve and then probably if these valves uh, get degenerated in the future maybe we can do a tavi 
uh, for this patient. Uh, so one uh, layer of uh, metal can be avoided and uh, uh, thereby we can probably optimize the outcome. And patient may probably need two TAVI procedures in the lifetime. And uh, uh, I think that can probably have a better outcome uh, uh, in this patient. Pranik, two more questions for you, and then I will uh, see if any of my attendees have any other thoughts. So, number one, again, I'm speculating. What if this patient has a ascending aorta of 4.2 centimeters, which is which is very much possible if it's a bicuspid valve. 4.2 centimeter. The reason why I chose this number 4.2 centimeter is because uh, just this week itself. I had a patient, young patient with severe AS. I can't recollect the age, but probably in, in his 50s. Uh, severe AS, bicuspid, ascending aorta 4.2. This patient qualifies for AVR right now, but does not qualify, does not qualify for ascending aorta repair. So how do you counsel this patient to go for AVR? And then what happens in the future regarding the ascending aorta? It is it is a, a very uh, difficult situation. You know that there is iotopathy in patients who are having bicuspidiatic well, and this iotopathy is going to progress. But how and when it will progress is a question that is um, to be answered. Most of the patients they do remain stable for quite some time, and then there is a period where the disease can progress. Now, for this patient, uh, we need to, he, he does not have uh, any, uh, we don't know previous scans, so we don't know how his iotopathy is progressing. Ideally, if you have previous scans to compare, you look at the rate of progression of iotopathy, like what is the size of iota increasing, maybe 0.5 centimeter per year is the probably the rate of progression, then you know that these iotopathy is progressing and you can uh, recommend. Uh, uh, simultaneous uh, root replacement for this patient because you know that iotopathy is progressing. When this uh, information is not available, then uh, you probably have to give the benefit of doubt to the patient. And uh, because the um, the lesser the lesser uh, complex is the procedure, I would recommend this patient to undergo a valve replacement. Also explaining the uh, possibility that there is a disease that can progress and there is a need for repeat intervention. Uh, so because the patient currently has a problem of valvular pathology, aortic um, stenosis, which is bothering him, I would focus only on uh, doing a valve replacement, not touch the iota unless there is any other um, findings which is um, uh, recommending or suggesting me to touch the root. I would uh, uh, ask my surgeon only to replace the valve. With uh, the here again, the indication of a valve will be based on the previous conditions because he's a relatively young patient. I would recommend him to undergo an isolated surgical valve replacement with a metallic valve and then keep him under follow up. And if the root pathology progresses, then delete at a separate uh, setting. So that is how I would uh, um, uh, recommend this patient alone. And the last question, Praneet, to you. So, so far, I have got a uh, quite consensus in the response that surgical AVR is the way to go and uh, metallic valve is the way to go. But uh, hear me out. Metallic valve, again, anticoagulation at this age may not be that problematic, but after 10 years, now that will pretty much dictate how a person is uh, leading his or her life. Uh, why not go for surgical aortic valve with bioprosthetic now? with the intention of doing valve in valve, these days you get a lot of these inspiration and all these good valves which can expand in the future. So you put a bioprosthetic valve now and uh, hope for uh, at least getting 10, 15 years out of it. And at age 55 or 60, you put a supra uh, uh, annular self-expandable valve at that time, which is TAVI, uh, that will give her another 10 years or so. So you are basically planning for age 70, up to age 70, you are planning for this patient. Although we are not allowed to play God in terms of we are not allowed to dictate how much should be the life expectancy of a person. But with this plan, this patient gets 
up to age 70 without any anticoagulation. Of course, some uncertainty about bioprosthetic degeneration, but that uncertainty is there with metallic valve and uh, its related complication as well. Uh, talk me through this. Why this plan is not a good plan? Where you do SAVR with uh, with newer bioprosthetic valve now and a tab, tab in SAV later on? Strictly speaking, this idea is actually uh, very good and it is a um, very innovative thought where you are trying to utilize all the resources available and all the knowledge available and trying to put it into one place. So, yes, so, so uh, if this patient underwent a surgical aortic valve replacement with a bioprosthetic valve, which degenerates after 10 years, we can put a TAVI once and uh, you are leaving, uh, leaving now a layer of uh, metal there and probably if this gets degenerated then another layer but what after that uh, is uh, something which we do not have like can you put a third uh, valve in the existing two layers is something which is an issue then other thing is about the cost of the procedure and the uh, the other issue is about the repeat uh, procedures now uh, Putting up all these things uh, on a paper, on a thing looks uh, very exciting and uh, kind of uh, probably uh, solves all the problem. But uh, uh, practically speaking, uh, is it really that we should be doing? It doesn't uh, kind of uh, make sense to me where all these issues like the need for repeat interventions. Instead of that, you can do one procedure, which will probably it will take care of all the problems in the the lifetime so uh, so yes so on paper it looks exciting but i think practically it is um, uh, it does not is it doesn't look palatable to me well the whole palatability situation <clears throat> relates to anticoagulation because uh, uh, warfarin or uh, acinocumarol for rest of the life particularly as you grow older uh, it's a it's a, it's a major challenge, and uh, while it may not be obvious right now, uh, it may become an issue later on. Uh, at this point, I will pause for uh, a minute, and then I will ask if anybody has got any comments about this. A little bit of kind of a speculative discussion that we had so far, uh, but uh, the idea here is to kind of get all the combinations uh, in front of us so that we can share our thought process. So anybody has got any further questions or comments or you want to add anything? Yes, Dr. Ravi. Yeah, a uh, few things uh, I'd like to share. Basically, uh, I have a patient in my follow-up. I would like to share the details of the patient. Maybe this will give us some more insights. Uh, this is a 65-year-old uh, gentleman now. Uh, he had undergone IIT called replacement at the age of uh, 35 to 40 years. So uh, uh, then he's on uh, acetone since then. Doctor, doing Ravi, there's a lot of background noise at your end. Maybe some music or something. Is it possible uh, for you to mute that? Okay. So <laughs> actually, I, I was uh, driving and I stopped my car maybe due to the vehicle uh, vehicle noise and all. So uh, I'll, I'll try like to. Instrument. There is almost looks like there is a musical instrument in your background. Oh, is it? Okay. Okay. Maybe maybe the noise is on my side. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Maybe the noise is on my side. Okay. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Huh? Sorry. So this uh, this patient uh, was an acetron doing relatively well. So at the age of, uh, you can say 60 years approximately, I mean, uh, he's done follow up for so many years. So he started this uh, episodes of uh, uh, GI bleed. I mean, chronic GI bleeds, which lead to intermittent episodes of severe anemia, uh, hemoglobin dropping down to six, seven, and uh, every time getting blood transfused. So the problem was at this stage, by the time he reached 60, 65, uh, there was development of panis and the gradients were very high, uh, this patient. Though he was not symptomatic yet, but uh, the gradients were, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, very high. And that uh, uh, provoked me to actually to advise him for a, a further uh, uh, redo procedure. Uh, and the patient uh, uh, also, I mean, uh, Otherwise, healthy male, no other problems. Uh, he uh, goes about his life. 
and he was also reluctant to go for the surgery again but uh, uh, eventually uh, due to this uh, persistence of high gradients we all know i mean how that can go and uh, uh, subsequently i referred him for redo uh, surgery uh, the, now the question here was very tricky i mean at the age of 65 what do we do uh, do we consider again a, a metallic wall or do we uh, consider a, a bioprosthetic wall so uh, uh, this was discussed with the surgeon several times surgeons were reluctant initially to do a redo surgery so this this is what i came across i mean for the redo surgery also there was apprehension among surgeons why to do now the patient is asymptomatic you see these were the uh, replies but the thing was uh, with acetrom he was getting chronic gi bleed and uh, need for repeated blood transfusions and that somehow uh, i mean got the patient going that yes maybe if i get uh, bioprosthetic wall the need for acetrom goes and my anemia problem will be sorted and when the need for repeated blood transfusions will not be there so uh, somehow after repeated counseling after repeated meetings uh, and discussions and uh, with the ct surgeon also the patient underwent uh, a redo surgery and it went uh, really successfully patient is doing well and uh, uh, the surgeons put a bioprosthetic wall for the patient at the age of 65 years so he has been totally explained maybe another 10 15 years it will come but uh, that's okay it seems so i think this uh, history of this patient gives a very good idea at the age of 35 to 40 years uh, 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 metallic prosthetic wall was uh, done for this patient and which lasted for approximately 30 years 25 to 30 years that's a big uh, time and although the need for acetrom was there but uh, he lived his life i mean uh, without any problems and uh, uh, the, the, this that's why i mean considering the age of the patient uh, uh, the need for a surgical eye to wall replacement with a, a metallic prosthetic wall i think uh, uh, would be the top on the list for this patient one more thing I would like to uh, suggest is uh, regarding coronary angiogram. Well, uh, not only do we look for coronary artery disease, we should also look for coronary anomalies, particularly if it's a bicuspid aortic valve that we are dealing with. We never know the patient might have some coronary anomaly which we might pick up with a coronary angiogram. So if we, anyway, if we are opening the uh, chest and if something needs to be corrected, then we can get it corrected. Thank you, Anup. Thank you so much, Dr. Ravi. Pranit, do you have anything to add? Yeah, so uh, Dr. Ravi's uh, um, case uh, reminded me of a, a case which uh, we had earlier. Like this, uh, the whole business of anticoagulation or the problem of dealing with anticoagulation. Uh, like, uh, again, uh, on a similar line, a patient who had a um, metallic valve, a mechanical valve who was on anticoagulation, who was having uh, repeat uh, or recurrent uh, strength from valve thrombosis. Like he had, I think, one episode of uh, uh, valve thrombosis for which we had to thrombolyze him. Uh, luckily, he was better, but I think uh, we were not able to reach his uh, therapeutic INR levels. He was uh, not responding or probably allergic. I think uh, uh, Dr. Sumraj, you remember this case. I think it, he was, it was one of his patients where we had very, uh, very much difficulty in titrating. Um, anticoagulation, be it warfarin or be it esinocumerol, uh, and the patient was also given antiplatelet, I, but still he had an issue, and I believe we had to give a trial of newer oral anticoagulants. Yes, the data is uh, uh, limited in this regard, and we still don't know, and we don't have a, uh, evidence, the so-called evidence-based uh, guidelines or recommendation to use newer oral anticoagulants in mechanical valves but if if we think that the newer oral anticoagulant which have indications uh, quite in, uh, quite vast but if this problem can be solved where if we can uh, do some studies or we have some evidence where if newer oral anticoagulants can effectively uh, maintain the valve patency and probably most of the uh, ill effects of the vitamin k antagonist can be abated and probably the decision making will be even more easier. Uh, I think uh, we don't have data, but I think that should be something uh, probably worth considering. I believe we can, if we can get some uh, data or evidence or some conference uh, where new, uh, the usage of newer oral anticoagulants in patients with mechanical valve, probably things may be much simplified. 
Thank you, Praneet. Uh, I think the case that you described and then the case that Dr. Ravi described, there are actually established guidelines which uh, uh, mentions, now I'm going to come out of my devil's advocate mode. So there are, there are actual guidelines which clearly mention that if you have a patient with metallic valve anywhere, and if there are recurrent issues with anticoagulation, then uh, it is very reasonable to go for a redo surgery and put a bioprosthetic valve. Uh, that could be bleeding complications related to anticoagulation. That could be difficult to maintain uh, therapeutic uh, anticoagulation, or uh, that could be recurrent thrombosis on the top of anticoagulation. So all of these are very, very established criteria uh, of uh, sending a patient with a good functioning valve uh, to expand that metallic valve and put a bioprosthetic uh, valve in there. So uh, very, very uh, common, I would say, scenario in metallic valve uh, spectrum that we often see in our practice. The other thing about chondry angiogram, the recommendations would suggest that males of age more than 40, if age less than 40, then uh, with risk factors. And for female, they don't, don't use an age cutoff, but they use a menopause as the criteria. So any postmenopausal female, uh, they should go for an angiogram. In premenopausal female, if you have risk factors, then you go for angiogram. Now that's a very standard criteria, but of course we have to um, uh, customize it to individual patients. What is also mentioned is that uh, you don't necessarily have to go for invasive angiogram. In fact, uh, American Heart Association would uh, uh, allow you to do a CT angiogram also, provided it comes normal. Uh, the European guidelines still emphasize on invasive angiogram, but uh, what we have started doing is in our TAVI cases, when we do a CT TAVI protocol, we also look for countries, and if they are normal, then we follow the American Heart Guidelines where we don't subject these patients to invasive angiography. And I think that is something which uh, AHA endorses even in surgical cases. So A, to first find the criteria of who should get an angiogram, and second, once you have decided, you have an option of going for CT versus invasive, depending upon what the patient profile is. If you go for CT, then ob obviously that can give you much clearer information if there is any anomalous arteries as well as what Dr. Ravi has pointed out. So that is the overall idea. I didn't share my thoughts for this particular case. Uh, I think I have to agree with the common consensus here that is this patient should go for surgery and this patient should go for a metal valve. In fact, truly speaking, if this case would have uh, been presented to me a week back, I would have said there is no discussion about it. This case should go for surgery, metallic valve, case closed. But because there was all this discussion going on amongst cardiologists, I thought that all these points, no matter how speculative they are in nature, it deserves a thought process. So with this, uh, I will ask Somaraju sir to give his comments about today's discussion and where did we get it, get it wrong? and uh, his overall comments. Samaraja, sir. Thank you, Anup and uh, <clears throat> Pranit, can you hear me? Uh, yes, sir, we can hear you. Uh, about the, not the aortic wall, the other patient, the metal wall replacement uh, with a seemingly well-maintained INR and had a problem. Uh, one thing we should do is uh, INR that you do in your institution, what was it? Number one. Number two, did you check the patient's uh, isnosal count and also B12 and homocysteine? These are important to check in such patients. And then coming to the aortic wall, uh, I won't go into all the details except telling you that uh, when you talk about uh, intervention on the aorta in a bicuspid aortic wall, the body size matters. Uh, the example is Strana syndrome, uh, aortic aorta and uh, Bacchus uh, uh, go through that, you will know. So body size matters in making decisions. And if uh, if you are doing an aortic uh, wall replacement in a patient with a borderline and large aorta, uh, redo surgery carries higher risks. And post-operative, patients have a higher risk, post aortic wall surgery uh, patients have a higher risk of dissection even though the aorta is not too much dilated. Keep all that in mind before you make decisions and body size matters also. So then lastly, I must tell you, uh, without talking about economics, 
in decision making in Taver versus Taver, uh, it is in complete discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, one question for you. The second case that I was discussing in a patient who had this valve problem, uh, now that the valve is dysfunctional in a patient who is symptomatic, just not very decompensated, uh, the decision was made for this patient to go for redo surgery. Uh, two questions for you. Number one, do you see any need of doing empiric uh, low dose prolonged thrombolysis in an, in an assumption that even if it is a chronic thrombotic occlusion, maybe we'll be able to clear up the valve. That is number one. And second, if this patient has to go for surgery, he's 46 now, uh, would you still recommend him to go for a second metallic valve or would you tell the surgeon that it's better off uh, getting a bioprosthetic valve now? Samaraj, sir. Uh, um, I think it's not low dose. You must give a, a trial of uh, lytic therapy and uh, wait and see if it is not an emergency. And uh, secondly, uh, if you are not able to reach any conclusion and this is the problem, this patient, if you are really able to confirm that the INRs are well maintained and is still going on, uh, a bioprosthetic wall will be a better choice. Perfect. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, if anybody has got any final comments before we close the session, uh, Praneet, your quick closing comments about today's discussion. I think uh, um, these are the situations where you sometimes have to think out of the box and some of the previous patient experiences, sometimes uh, they do uh, interfere with the decision making and sometimes you doubt yourself whether I, I am making a proper recommendation. And the the some of these questions which, uh, which patients they put up a beat in terms of after reading internet or after hearing from something, uh, the Spanish formation and the need for repeat interventions and the challenges with anticoagulation. I think these are all, uh, they do kind of uh, sometimes interfere with your decision making and sometimes you doubt yourself whether you are making a, uh, the correct recommendation to the patient. But uh, as, is, as uh, we discussed, uh, some we need to look at the uh, majority or the so-called uh, guidelines or the recommendations, but maybe for a given patient, uh, you may have to modify, but uh, it's always uh, ideal to uh, err on the safer side or do what uh, the guidelines suggest to recommend. And uh, that is what it has to be done. And for one given patient, because it, he was unfortunate or there was some issue, it should not be generalized. And these are only one unfortunate instances. And I think uh, still those uh, general recommendations uh, stand correct and uh, we should follow them. Thank you, Praneet, and thank you all of you for sharing your comments. Uh, we'll see you again next Wednesday with a new topic. Till that time, uh, have a good rest of the week. Good night. We'll see you next Wednesday.